do you think more people from your generation need to be coaching this current one? If they're passionate about it and if um, their intentions are the right ones, uh, absolutely. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a generational thing. You know, I think, you know, you look at Gino, who's on our staff, um, who's played at a high level as well. You know, um, Gary mm-hmm. over there at Nazareth, who's doing a great job with those guys. You know, I think we have quite a few guys. My friend Rashad Bell is coaching uh, on the AU circuit. Mm-hmm. We got uh, quite a few guys from our generation, so to speak, who are back involved in New York City basketball. We're kind of in that generation where we are not too removed from the the, the younger guys now. Mm-hmm. Like we know how to use our cell phones and <laughs> <laughs> right, we know how to we, we post on Instagram too. Yeah. <laughs> but we also remember what it was like before that and what the environment was. You know, I think there's some benefits of our generation's thinking just because of some of the experiences we had that these guys, you know, it doesn't, you know, kind of doesn't exist anymore. Back here once again, another installment. So we're reporting live one-on-one sit-downs, and I know you guys are getting tired of the way I give my intros. You know, every one of my guests are special, but I definitely want to keep saying that because individuals that come on this platform, I try to make sure that they're here for a reason. They 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 put in their own groundwork, and we should shed light on that. So first, I'm gonna just let the guest introduce himself. Go ahead. Um, coach Kevin Hamilton, I'm head coach at Eagle Academy Brooklyn. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, I like that because one coach Kev, I haven't always. You don't. You don't talk a lot. I would say I, when people bring you up, you're like yeah, you got to talk to Coach Kev. He does this. He's been doing this. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. I understand. I've done my research. So, but of course, let's start off with ego. The obvious, right? You guys coming off of a PSAO championship, being Jefferson High School. First, I want to start by asking you, when people hear Eagle Brooklyn, what are they supposed to think? What are they supposed to feel when they hear about the school or they go in the gym and they see how you guys play? Um, I hope that they, you know, they're impressed with the quality of basketball. I mean, Mm -hmm. from the school in general, the school's had a reputation far beyond basketball for a long time. It's been a great academic institution for like 16 years now. Yeah. We've had a lot of success academically, 96% graduation rate. So we've been trying to, you know, play catch up. Uh, as far as athletics has come. But um, I think we've developed a reputation of a team that's been disciplined, plays hard, uh, tries to play the right way, and, you know, represent ourselves pretty well. So, of course, Eagle is an all-boys school, um, for those that didn't know. One thing I do want to touch on before, like when I first started getting into the high school realm, because I am from – I got into this community through streetball. So when I started tapping into the high school and I wanted to – capture you know both sides of jefferson versus eagle during the recent psal championships i asked to get in i was told can't get in no cameras and stuff like that i only bring it up to ask where does that come from Be- this was at eagle uh not at eagle but like i tried i tried to reach out to coach k tried to reach out to gino some people were saying not some people uh they were just saying we don't want any camera superstition stuff like yeah, that yeah yeah which i can respect so when it comes to these high level moments or when it comes to just dialing in locking in with the team where does that come from? Because that's not the first time I've heard saying, "All right, Eagle doesn't want cameras in their in their in their space at that moment." Yeah, apparently that's changed now. There's cameras <laughs> all over the place. Nah, yeah, I've seen how uh, it is this season, but of course it comes with it. You guys earned that. Yeah, you know, I think it was just a a point of the season where I didn't want the guys to get distracted. You know, we've had like a routine that we've um, become accustomed to to that point. And we didn't want to change it too much, make the game too big and get the guys, you know, like we were able to make it the championship the year before. Mm-hmm. And I felt to some extent that it kind of got bigger than us. And we weren't prepared for the moment because we was focused on too many other things. So I wanted things to kind of remain the same, as close to the game as possible. Obviously, it's a, a bigger game than usual. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't want the guys to get distracted. I didn't want, you know, I just wanted to try to keep a routine as well. So in, let's, you, you mentioned the previous championship that you were at the year before against South Shore. So I ask that because you took a loss, first time being in the chip, chip as a program and as a school, as a team. 
you lose to those guys and then you beat them in the final four the next year and then you come back and win at some point how do, what, how do you gauge the win versus the loss like how did that loss propel y'all to the win if you could um i think that you know maybe in general the year before we just weren't prepared for that moment kind of kind of like i explained with you know the hoopla of things mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you experience, when you have that experience of getting to a championship and losing, um, it, you benefit from it in a lot of ways, not just from having the experience, but also, you know, a motivating factor. We wanted to get back there and we didn't want to have the same feeling. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the only, uh, you know, external influence, or so to speak, that I can think of. Got you. So, of course, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask this question. But, of course, the last shot, Eddie's shot. Um, I, where you, I, from what I'm told, you were the one that called the play or somebody drew it up. Try to give the guys, give me, why that specific play and, of course, why Eddie. Yeah, I mean, Eddie's, aside from him being, you know, the best shooter in New York City mm -hmm. uh, as a guy that I had a lot of faith in because he works extremely hard. He, he shoots every single day. You know, he's experiencing an injury right now that he's going to work through, but mm -hmm. extremely hard worker, and you tend to have trust in people who've shown you over and over that they've taken this shot and they prepare for those type of moments. The play, though, in my head, you know, we had just two of our guys have fouled out. Taj and uh, mm -hmm. Emar have yeah. fouled out. Uh, Trey was playing with a broken foot and that he, he didn't even know that. So just looking about, you know, what the next five minutes would look like in the overtime situation, I, I didn't feel too confident <laughs> about it. Um, so, I, you know, I wanted to go for the win. And so I drew up the play for Eddie to get that shot in that space. I didn't anticipate him being that open. So I told him that, you know, if someone's running out of him, it's a pump fake and lean into him, try to get to the free throw line. But And if he got the shot to shoot it, and he shot it, and the rest is history. So definitely the rest is history. So now let's transition to from one high level moment to high level moments that you've possibly played in your career, right? So we go to Archbishop Malloy, then you go to Holy Cross, Hall of Fame inductee for that college as well. Um, freshman of the year, if I'm correct. No. No, that was hold up. Defensive player of the year. Yeah. And and just a bunch of more accolades in that space and then going over to overseas. Let's start with the high school college part. In that moment of your of your of your career in basketball, what was the moment that taught you the most lessons, good or bad, in that time frame? In high school? Yes. Let's talk about high school. Yes. You know, honestly, it was adversity. It wasn't anything like uh, you know making all city, and you know I was able to do that my senior year, and we had a team that was you know really good. We were like number six in the nation. Mm -hmm. But when I think about my high school days, and what I'm most thankful for was not playing. Like when I was a junior, I didn't play that much. I was like five points a game or something like that. And there was a lot of competition. Uh, we had guys like Marlon Smith and Sunday Out of Gaines and Thomas Harrison and Ed O'Neill and Wendell Gibson, on and on. We were a really good team. And, you know, times are different now. Uh, you know, I don't know what I would have done in today's day. I might have transferred. I don't know. <laughs> but that wasn't even like a consideration at the time. It, it built character in my in my opinion, the fact that I had to earn my position my senior year, nothing was guaranteed to me. I couldn't run away from, you know, the competition I had to deal with every single day with all these other Division One players. And I feel like that's benefited me in many different situations. When I get to college and I'm a freshman and you're kind of starting over again, I'm not discouraged by it because I was in that situation in high school. When you're playing overseas, you know, in this high stakes situation, if you don't play well, they send you home. So, you, you know, you get used to pressure. You get used to um, fighting for your position, earning trust in your coach. So when I think about high school, I think about the adversity I went through, and I'm, I'm thankful for it. Uh, I want to continue down your, your, your timeline as a person and as a hooper, but that just brings about this question to me, from me as in this current New York City landscape, this current New York City landscape of high school basketball players, whether they're the highly touted or the guys that are just trying to get their name out there, what? How do you feel about this current landscape? Whether it's the transfers, whether it's guys just wanting to play more and possibly leaving places, or just going to other places for opportunity. I think it's tough to be a kid. Um, there's so many different variables now that weren't present when I when I was playing. You know, the transfer culture stuff that wasn't 
a really a thing. You know, it happens sometimes, but at that point, from what I remember, if you transfer, you had to sit out a year. So it didn't happen that often. You know, now it's kind of like the Wild West, and you know, kids and it's like <laughs> they they call the transfer portal in high school. Yeah. And I, it's not really a transfer portal, but that's how crazy it is. Um, I've kind of spoken on this before. I'm a little bit torn with it because I feel that, um, like I mentioned, I benefited from the adversity I went through in high school. I think a lot of kids are missing that lesson, missing that experience about how to fight through things. And you know, you get taught. You know, if you're, you know, leaning on transferring every time something gets tough, that every time something gets tough in life, you just run away. You know what I'm saying? Instead of attacking a situation and earning something. That being said, uh, there's situation where kids are not in the place they should be and there's better opportunities for them. So it's, it's tough. There's a lot of people, you know, that deal with this. It's a lot to evaluate. Mm-hmm. Um so it's it's hard to say. It depends on the situation. When it comes to just uh, getting through tough times, situations, uh, do you think that's just part of the culture that we're in, as in the different generations, as in your generation, guys before you, they talk about the toughness, they talk about different things. Yeah. What about it? Do you think that plays a major role here, or is it just guys just want to take things into their own hands, or families would like to take things into their own well, hands? Well, families, de- families are definitely a factor. Okay. And um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of factors in it, and that's why I say it's so difficult to be a kid. And I was thinking about this the other day because um, you know, when I was a professional, <clears throat> I had multiple agents. I, I I changed agents like three or four times. And when I look back at it, I might have I sh- should have stayed with my first agent. Uh, definitely my third agent was somebody that I should have stuck with. But, you know, you get influenced. There's people that come to you and say, I could do this for you. I can get you this type of day. I can get you in this type of country. And at that point, I'm already an adult. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So imagine how impressionable a kid is that's 15, 16 years old, that's, you know, receiving information from people that they trust all around them. It's, it's, very, it's a very difficult situation to be in. I guess um, the only thing I would advise is if you um, are – interested in getting information in a decision like that uh, you may want to get it for somebody that's kind of been there before you know not to discriminate not to say you can't learn from somebody who hasn't been in that situation who's made mistakes but Mm -hmm. you know if I if I if I live in a projects and I want to learn how to invest I'm gonna want to learn from Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio I'm probably not gonna listen to somebody on the second floor, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, like, you want somebody that, that has that experience. That has the experience and what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, go into. Tough situation, man. Tough. It's a lot. There's a lot of, lot of factors. You talk about um, wanting to learn from people that uh, have done it before, have been in that experience, been in that situation. Um, you are a hooper, hooper at heart. So when it comes to coaching kids, right? I've been told that um, you guys at Eagle past years, I don't know about currently, but definitely last year, you guys scrimmaged with your kids, played against them five on five, one on ones, whatever it is. So <laughs> talk about, I've been told that Coach Kevs gives it to the kids <laughs> and they get tired about it because they can't do nothing about it. So talk about, I know you played point guard or combo guard in yeah. your pro career. So talk about you playing those two positions, knowing New York City is guard heavy and you got a couple good guards on your squad as well in years past and this year. So what's that dynamic when you go against those guys? Yeah, I, I haven't jumped in there in a minute. I did a, <laughs> When I was in Puerto Rico a little bit, I jumped in there with these guys. Mm-hmm. I was in a car accident in September, last September, that kind of derailed me a little. No, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm all right now. But, um, you know, that's just part of that is like competitive spirit stuff. Um, there is an element of trying to show the guys that, you know, we know what we're talking about and, we, we you know, we're, we're not just posers. Has, but, it, has it gotten a little bit too far, as in the competitiveness? No, it's, it's not usually that competitive. <laughs> <laughs> Copy, I but, see where uh, we're going, yeah. But, um, you know, I think it, as, as as long as we're young enough to participate in that and show the guys that, you know, we, we, we played the game and we kind of um, – I think that you get a different level of respect from your player when they know that you are willing to do or have done what you're asking them to do. So if they, you know, if you could come out and show them occasionally that you're willing to do those things, you know, I work out every single day, 
I encourage the guys to come and check me out. Mm -hmm. And it's more so to show them, like, you know, you when you when you push yourself and you hold yourself accountable, you're gonna see results. And then you can be in a position to demand it of others. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if you know, if I'm not somebody that's willing to go through what I'm asking you to go through, you could question, you know, my word a little bit. So I enjoy getting out there with the guys when I can. Coach K is way more active than I am right now. But um, it's always fun. It's always competitive. And it usually leads to, to you know, really exciting practices because the guys really want to try to pull off a win. Definitely. Uh, so let's get back to you, right? So I said earlier, play point guard overseas. I, one thing that I've actually asked guys that I know played overseas, of course, the atmosphere. I'm a guy that likes soccer at heart, for mm -hmm. sure. And I know overseas soccer is definitely different from soccer in the States. So talk about that atmosphere um, where you might see fire in the stands, a heavy smoke, uh, a big sign with maybe your face on it or something like that. Like they, <laughs> those fans go all the rage. So talk about playing in that atmosphere when you're just a guy from Queens, New York. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I remember my first professional game I played in, uh, in Poland. It was a team called Polpak. And um, I threw up. I was, I was on the sideline. I had to run to the bathroom. There was flares. There was drums. There was flags. Everybody standing up. You could barely breathe before the smoke in the gym. And this was before the game started. You know, the fans are extremely enthusiastic. Um, you know, there, there's a different sense of pride because, you know, you, especially if you're playing like a small town or something, sometimes that team is all that they have. Mm -hmm. So it's packed and people are passionate. Um, it's, it's really it's something that you kind of have to experience. I know I've, I've seen some clips now of um, online of like games and partisan and something like that, mm -hmm. which I was fortunate enough to play in. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience. I hope some of the guys I coach get to experience it one day. When it comes to those moments, because I know you've spoken about this before, and other hoopers have definitely voiced this, uh, the the distance from family. I don't know if your family traveled with you during those times, but try to give a picture of. What was one of your hardest moments where you didn't know if you kept if you wanted to keep doing that? Well, I I really didn't experience that until later on in my career. When well, actually, I guess that answers your question. When my family was with me pretty early. I played my first two years by myself. Mm -hmm. Then my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, came out there um, with my um, oldest daughter. My youngest daughter was actually born in Germany. Um, but towards the end of my career, when I was getting hurt pretty often and my wife wanted to pursue her own endeavors, and we did kind of like a gap year. And so I was in Puerto Rico at the time and she was home uh, starting her career. And that was difficult for me. You know, when you get accustomed to waking up to your family and your kids every single day, um, food being made for you and things like that. <laughs> um, and then that, that, that goes away, and, you know, you, you really miss it. But, you know, something I think about now, like my grandmother passed recently, and when you go overseas, I, I, and this is something I don't think people incorporate, how difficult it is, is, you know, time passes by really quickly. And, you know, I, I, I went overseas, my brother was, you know, young. By the time I ended my career, my brother was a man, you know what I'm saying? And my, my grandmother was really active, and chasing me with a broom in a Puerto Rican, you know, household. And then mm -hmm. by the time I, my career was over, you know, she really slowed down. You know, life moves on when you're out there. So you miss your family, you miss food, you miss, you know, TV, you miss social interactions with people that speak the same language as you. But, you know, I wouldn't, you know, as much as I, you know, wish I still was able to have some more moments with those people, basketball is my passion. It's what I wanted to do. I'm, and I, I had some amazing experiences, and I, I don't regret it. What was, I guess, I guess I don't want to narrow it to just one because I know you've had probably a lot in those 10 years. Let's give us two or three moments where, you've, you, where you just remember to this day where it's like, nah, yeah, I can relive that moment every day if I could. Well, I, I was fortunate to win three championships over there. So obviously each one of those is a really special moment. Um, Puerto Rico in particular was a team called My Aguess that I played for for five years. Mm -hmm. I had family that's on side, that side of the island. Um, and I still have a relationship with that club. My, my team, Eagle, goes out there almost every every year. 
And, you know, they kind of host us. They allow us to use the facilities. They put us up in the hotels that they usually put the players in. They help us, you know, they help us out with all the travel details and things of that nature. So having that relationship is really special. And having those experiences with people um, is really special. So the championship years, for sure. Uh, my daughter's birth was, was, was a crazy moment. I was actually... We played. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah we were playing overseas. at home. I was playing Allen Ray. I remember that. Um, we were playing uh, a race team. And at the end of the game, you know, the team manager kept walking by my bench and staring at me. I'm like, what is this guy? What is this guy looking <laughs> at? Like, we're losing. My, I don't want to be looked at you by you. I was pissed. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as the game ended, he's like, Kev, your wife's in the hospital. Kev's your wife's in the hospital. So Dr. Otto, our team doctor, um, you know, was, was you know, gracious enough to take me to the hospital when my daughter was born in Pegnance, which was like two hours away from the from stadium I was in. And he was he was zooming, man. He was doing, <laughs> you know, the Autobahn, you can go as fast as you want. And he went as fast as he wanted. I really appreciate that. I get to the hospital. The, uh, two of my teammates' wives were at the door, like waving me in, like, hurry up, hurry up. I ran up the stairs. My daughter was born five minutes later. So you didn't get to mix. So I, I just made it. Just made it. So get a round of applause. Yeah, that round of applause. <laughs> so that was a crazy moment. You know, it's uh, I, had, I had a lot of great experiences. Those were probably the top two. Okay, so uh, I I like to ask you know a couple personal questions where like what did you learn, right? So in that time frame going over there, <clears> you know, you talked about the loneliness sometimes, uh, the time missed with family or or these experiences that you still gained. So what, what did you learn as a young man going in and then now as a more mature man coming out? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I talked to some of my friends who also were able to play about that. And for me personally, um, something interesting that I felt like I learned, you know, I was a, I was a pretty materialistic guy back in the day. And, um, I learned how much you don't need, right? That like in Europe, people live a much simpler life, right? I'll, I'll tell like w one quick story. I was actually talking to Jakai about this. Um, so there was a team I played for in, in Germany. And um, when I landed, the owner of the team picked me up from the airport, took me to my apartment, really nice guy. And, um, you know, I, I had no, learned a little bit about him before getting there. Uh, you know, you speak to the coach, you speak to the, the 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 general manager and stuff like that when you're in the negotiation process or whatever yeah. the case may be. So um, he was a very wealthy man. He sold, like, some printing company or something like that. And so he took me to my apartment. He says, hey, you know, get settled in. By the end of this week, you know, you and your family come over to my house for dinner. I was like, okay, cool. Like, wait, wait, wait how far is your house from me? He's like, my house is right across the street. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, it was, an, it was a nice apartment. Yeah. But based on what I was being told about him, I was expecting, you know, like across the, I wasn't expecting to live in an apartment, I'd say that. Yeah, something a little bit more lavish. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right? So, um, we go into his house and it's nicer than mine, but you know, still I was like pretty modest. So we're having dinner and um I said, you know, I said it to him. I was like, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, you know, I was expecting to see a mansion and I heard about your, you know, your prince and company and stuff like that. And he didn't even say anything. He just walked into another another room and came back with like this book of pictures. And it's him and his family all over the world, like Vietnam, Bali. He loved Vietnam. He had pictures like on elephants and stuff <laughs> like that. And he was like, you know, I, I like to spend my money on experiences with my family. Wow. <clears throat> and, you know, he drove a Skoda. I don't know if you know what that is. It's like a French Car, or Skoda. Car? No, no, the name of the car is Skoda. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, so, so it's that. not like it's not like a Benz or it's, you know a modest car. Mm -hmm. And he had properties in other places and stuff like that. But he lived in an apartment with his family, and it, it, made, me, it made me, you know, put things in perspective. Like this guy has been all over his world, his family, his kids have seen all these different things and had all these experiences, and you know, made me think differently about things when I when I came home. Mm -hmm. And in general, it changed my perspective. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a big thing that I learned. Wow. That's how much you really don't need. I wasn't expecting need. that one. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a good lesson. Uh, America is too materialistic. Let's, let's go with that. I like that. 
uh let's pave it forward now so um of course i've watched other podcasts as you've been on just to take your notes um and shout out to all the podcasts that you've been on they actually definitely did a good job one thing i i one tidbit that i caught it's a story from when after your uh overseas career not after before your overseas career you had a mini camp with the celtics right yeah. and you told this story where um, it goes like this where he's saying you went to go box out Gerald Green and when he turned around he <laughs> saw his foot instead yeah. of his body. Yeah. So I just ask that as a person that loves the NBA, what is it like seeing the difference, the different levels as in, okay, you believe you're this level or people talk about their own level. What's it like seeing that next level in real time and did that discourage you at any point or what, what was that realization like when yeah, you... Yeah, at first it did. Um, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm pretty honest. You know, when I got there, I was nervous. You know what I'm saying? I, I was always a pretty confident guy, but, you know, the NBA is the NBA. So, you know, the first day, you know, I'm a little timid. I'm, I'm going through the drills, more so trying not to make mistakes than trying to make an impression. But as you get, like, accustomed to it in the game, it's basketball. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, I was a pretty cerebral basketball player. I was able to get by not being very athletic. But that is the difference. Those guys are extremely athletic. They're extremely strong. They're extremely tall. So, you know, sometimes there's some things that you may be able to get away with in college that you can't get away with at that level. There's shots that you could probably make that are going to get blocked. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> People, you know, Rondo, I played against that entire camp, was, you know, an elite defender. Like you, you couldn't be careless with the basketball. So it's it's a it's a step up for sure. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just ball. Uh, just another quick tidbit about your overseas career that I heard that that you spoke on as well. You said, well, uh, sometimes you would play overseas in Puerto Rico for a stretch of time, and then you would only take a couple of weeks, and then you're back to Europe or something. Yeah. So that means by math, it's only like probably like a month worth of family time or your own specific time here in the states. Uh, why? Um, why do the double time? Why put your body through that? Does that you sound like my wife? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I guess just to, before you start, like, was it just a passion for the game or is it to make ends meet? It was both. You know, I, I love to hoop uh, more so than anything, but at this point, you know, I have children and, you know, pretty modest beginnings. You want to try to uh, provide a lifestyle for them that you didn't have. How early did you have your first child? I had my first child my second year overseas. How old were you, roughly, if you can remember? Let me think about that. 22, 25? Okay. 24. My wife was like 22. We were both really young. Mm -hmm. So I was scared, man, you know? Uh, trying to establish a financial foundation for our family, make sure that we would be okay. Um... And then, you know, once you're doing something for a certain amount of years, you become accustomed to it. It's just the routine of things. I probably shaved a year or two off my career yeah, I towards the end. Before, yeah. But I wouldn't have taken it back. For nothing. Yeah, nah. Did you ever lose the love for the game at any point, whether it's high school, college, overseas? Was there ever a point where you, where you felt like giving up, though? Yeah, well, I wouldn't necessarily say losing love for the game or giving up. Mm -hmm. But like I said, when my... You know, my family returned home, um, and I was out in Puerto Rico by myself. That was that was a difficult time. Okay. My daughters were going to school. I didn't know, you know, what that was like. I, you know, uh, waking up to your kids every single day, um, and then they're just being taken—not necessarily taken, but well, just yeah. being gone—is yeah. is is an adjustment. And so I missed it. I missed them a lot. They came out a couple of times to come and visit me. But, you know, it made it, that was the first time that it was difficult for me to just focus on ball. So I wouldn't say I lost love for it or anything like that, but that was, um, yeah, it didn't last very long. I did one year of that. So uh, uh, I like to ask a little bit more personal questions. When it comes to fatherhood, uh, while trying to do what you're trying to do at that time and currently right now, what are things that you're learning now that I guess that you didn't, get to learn in those 10 years that you were yeah. uh, back and forth with well, family. One thing I learned recently is that my daughters wanted me to keep playing. Um, part of the reason I stopped was we were in France um, and 
we had like a bad educational experience. My daughter, I thought, you know, that the team was gonna put my daughter in a school, and when we got there, they put her in a public school mm. in France. In, you know, my my daughter don't Either speak way. French, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work out. So we had to, you know, pay for a Montessori school, and it was, you know. It made me think like I, I don't want to go too many years playing this game with my daughter's education. Like she has to have some stability. Um, I what was the question again? Uh, basically, what what did you learn? What are you learning now? Oh yeah, so yeah. That you but didn't so know about when I asked my daughter about it now, she's like, "Why did you stop?" I said, "You know," she was like, "No, I wanted you to keep playing. I liked it out there." So that's the first thing I learned. Um, I learned how difficult my wife's job was. Right, because you know she really held it down when I was playing. You know she did a majority of things. There'll be times I'll be out of town and she would be at home with the kids. And um, you know, sometimes you take that for granted. And so I have, I'm able to spend a lot more time, especially in the off season, a lot more time with my kids and all the running around and all the responsibilities. I couldn't imagine it being you know a toddler and an infant mm -hmm. and having to do and all the running around that's associated with that. Um. And I think, you know, through basketball and in general, both playing and coaching, um, just like the responsibility and understanding that people are always watching you and the example that you're setting. You know, my daughters are really involved in sports now. They both play basketball. Um, my oldest plays basketball and runs track. My youngest plays basketball and does gymnastics. And, you know, they're heavily influenced by it. So the example that you're setting for them is important. So um, I'm proud of how I was able to approach my overseas career. I took it really seriously. They saw me work really hard. And um, so they kind of know what it takes. Mm -hmm. And so um, seeing that transition to them and their lives now, you, you understand the influence that you have. You, you, you're, they're always watching. You're always setting an example. And uh, you know you always have to be mindful of that. So the man that I'm listening to, the man that I'm talking to, Sounds very soft-spoken, but his words have meaning. When he says things, he these are things that you feel uh, very passionate about when it comes to family, hooping, and the things that you just stand for. What led you to this point? What, what What's the reason for your demeanor? What's the reason for you acting the way that you act these days in life? Or what what's something from your youth that made you who you are today? Oh, uh, I think... Some, you know, and it's not always a good thing, but I think, okay. um, like, I have extreme perspective with everything. Like, I, I'm always thinking about, like, the bottom line with things and what's important and stuff like that. So, you know, meaningless words are not important. <laughs> like, meaningless <laughs> conversations are not important. And, um, you know, like, it, it's, it, and sometimes that's a, a detriment to me. Like you said, people say I don't talk much or I'm not a conversationalist. Um, but, yeah, and I, I think my, my, my background, you know, I, I was really fortunate. I grew up in Queens Village. It's pretty, you know, it's an urban neighborhood, but I had mm -hmm. both my parents. They're both really involved. I was, I was raised right. I was raised to, um, you know, to be a man. My father, like I mentioned, was, was an example. You know, he took care of his family. When I was growing up and where I was growing up, that was uncommon. You know what I mean? So I was I was, I was grateful for that. So I think all that stuff plays a part in how I approach family, how I approach being a coach and a counselor and a father. I don't know. I guess all the influences that I had, the traveling, seeing all the things I've been able to see, you know, that's what usually what makes up somebody's identity, they, what they see every single day, what they're surrounded by. So I guess I hope I've been surrounded by good things. So let's, let's one good thing is your coaching and in terms of your results. I don't want to keep talking about the results, but I want to talk more about your coaching acumen and how you coach. I would, first I would start off by saying, are you a player's coach since you've played before, or are you more strict with it? This is what 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 I say must go. How I say must go this way. Please describe how you are as a coach. Um. I think I think I'm tough on the guys. I'm really demanding. Um, you know, going back to like my story, I wasn't like a highly touted player. You know, like I mentioned, I only averaged like five points a game my junior year. Mm -hmm. 
So I feel like my path is more realistic than some other paths that, I, that I've been able to play where I've played and end up there. You know, usually, you know, guys are phenoms when they're seventh in seventh grade and they have <laughs> nicknames and you know what I'm saying? That wasn't my situation. So I really enjoy working with kids that are not in that position yet, but have potential and more importantly, love the game because that's kind of how I got to this point. So in order, when you come from less, you got to do more. And so we really hold the guys to a standard. Sometimes that makes some guys uncomfortable. Um, most times it makes some guys uncomfortable. But I think once they get through it, they're thankful for it. And I think that's the point where I become the players' coach when they, you know, they understand what that was all about. So I, I guess I'm a mixture of those two coaches you described. But I'm proud. You know, I, I admit I'm probably not easy to play for. So <laughs> when. Now I want to get to guys that have played with, played for you and are currently playing for you still. Uh, let's go with Ajani. Um, the way Ajani plays the game of basketball is one of the, one of the bright spots when you go watch Eagle play, Eagle Brooklyn play. He plays both ends. He encourages teammates that just had a bad play. He's locked in at all times. And I want to focus on the both ends part because it seems he fuels his offense through his defense. <laughs> That's what it seems like to me. I don't know if I'm getting that wrong, but talk about a Johnny and how he likes to chirp and get his game going. And he 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 wants the defensive matchup or the best guy. It seems. Yeah, a Johnny's a warrior, man. Um, he kind of exemplifies what we try to get out of kids, right? This passion for the game, um, this seriousness to it. He's an extremely hard worker. He's the hardest worker on our team. And because of that, like, you know, you know, sometimes a Johnny will take some questionable shots, right? But you live with it because of how hard he works and how passionate he is on both ends of the court. And, you know, I'm really proud of him. I think, um, you know, w coaches will come in for some of the, you know, more highly touted guys on our team. And he always leaves an impression. You know, every time that a coach leaves, they're saying, who's number one? Who's number one? Who's number one? They don't know what position he plays. They don't know. They just know, know he can do they it. They just know there's a presence on the court that he brings. And he's really important to our team. That's why he's uh, one of our captains. And uh, yeah, I, I expect him to be a good college basketball player too. For sure. Let's make sure we we get some get get that young man there. Uh, one that just got into college, or two that just that are currently going to the same college. Shep and Eric Acker, uh, very key implements to your last year squad and the years prior. Um, talk about the things that people didn't see when it comes to those two guys. Of course, we see all of their Instagram stuff. Eric Agra is all over the place, as he should, because he's put in the work, and Shep as well. But talk about what those guys put in that year where you had, it was almost like a redemption year for you guys since losing the previous year and coming back. Talk about the work those two guys put in. Yeah. Um, you know, when I spoke earlier about the kids that I saw that were kind of in my situation, those are like, the two prime examples. You know, Eric was a transfer to us from Lincoln. Um, and, you know, he was a skinny, scrawny kid uh, who was about to play JV, wanted a different environment. <laughs> and, you know, I saw just the, the natural, like, talent that he had that was, like, hidden under this skinny body. But, <laughs> but, but, Beyond that, I just saw a kid who loved basketball, loved basketball, loved basketball. Like couldn't get him out the gym. Always wants, to, you know, always smiling when he was on the court and had a natural passion for the game. And I think, and the same thing with Trey. You know, Trey loves to hoop. Like you, <laughs> you don't know how many times I had to like yell at Trey for playing in some random park tournament where he's like the tallest person by a foot. And I'm like, Trey, what are you doing? Like. I just wanted to play coach, you know, like they just loved the game. And when you have the passion for basketball like those two guys had, it makes the work so much easier, right? Because if you don't love basketball, it's going to be hard to get to be a Division One player or a professional player because of how much work goes into it. But when you love ball the way that those two guys do, um, the work, you begin to love the work as well. So what people don't see about those two guys were that they were consistently the two hardest workers in our gym every single day. Two guys that knew that they were gonna play every minute that they could. 
it never took a practice off, never took a play off. And that's why, you know, they're city champions and they're going to be very good bas college basketball players. Uh, next name I have for you, uh, he seems to be getting notoriety this year, but I watched him, not really watched him much last year, but I, I knew that he was in the room with you guys during the whole year. Um, Amir Dockery, right? I, I remember when I, you had missed this interview, this podcast interview, it was with Ross Slime and Cha-Ching after you guys won the chip, right? You weren't there, but I remember Amir was there and they were telling us like, yeah, he's in eighth grade. And we were like, oh, you're in eighth grade? Like, so talk, and the guys spoke highly of him. Yeah. And now these days, when you watch Amir, you see why he was always with the team as an eighth grader. Yeah. So talk to me <laughs> about why this freshman is now, I believe he starts for you guys, right? He does. Why did you make this freshman, some would say wet behind the ears, but why did you make this freshman your starting guard next to Ja'Kai, and now he's showing us why he deserves to start? Talk uh, about him. He, and I told him, I told him, man, it's, he forced me to start him. You know what I'm saying? Forced. He forced me to start him. Like, okay. you know, just like, you know, we took a tough loss yesterday. And so we did a lot of running today. Mm -hmm. And this guy comes in first in every sprint and every 17 and every suicide and every drill. And it's like consistent effort, every single practice. And he has natural skills. But, you know, what he dedicates himself to as a player is very rare. Like he enjoys playing defense. He enjoys picking up people 94 feet. He enjoys mucking the game up and, you know, making things difficult for the team and making the extra pass and making all the plays that are unselfish, that, you know, are some are not recognized by, like, the conventional mm -hmm. basketball fan. But uh, college coaches recognize that love and that. people who love the game uh, know about it. And it's just like, you know, I, I, really, I really like the kid. Um, and I was talking about, me and the coach were talking about him the other day. And they were like, you know, somebody asked me, like, what was the best part of coaching? And, you know, sometimes you'll be in a huddle. And I know, you know, all coaches probably know about this. And you can kind of get a gauge of who's locked in when you scan a huddle, right? You'll have the occasional guy who's, like, you know, tired from practice and looking up in the air. You know, somebody's leaning on somebody and looking at you. And then occasionally you'll catch a guy that's looking you dead in your eye just – waiting for information, waiting to learn more, you know, wanting to, to, to receive the message so that they can improve. And that's Doc. You know what I'm saying? He's locked in. And he's going to be a really special player. I'm really looking forward to coaching him the next couple of years. And, um, yeah, he's, he, he, I, I didn't want to start him. I don't, I don't want to start a freshman. I, I, I told him that to his face. But... You know, when you lead by example every single day and you are the hardest worker or one of the hardest workers on the team, as a coach, you got to give that kid the opportunity. To and, prove himself. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, one last name, uh, Ja'Kai, right? So I, I bring up his name because he's one of your transfers and he's playing the position you played as well overseas. And he's, he has a high aspirations to take the game of basketball to a high level. So when you see a guy that has – the body for it that can withstand the hits that can see over defenders and then you see a guy that also plays the same position what are you what's that player coach dynamic when he's I, I don't want to call him the face of the team but everywhere every time Eagle Brooklyn gets slated to play yeah he's the face everybody talks about and he's the name that always comes up so what's that like with the player coach dynamic with him I, I think we have a really good relationship <laughs> you know the funny thing about Ja'Kai and it's difficult to explain but, you know, uh, there's an exterior Ja'Kai of what everybody sees, right? His, his mannerisms, the way he walks, you know, the way he plays. The people would think the kid is a certain way, and mm -hmm. he's really not like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's really a kid, and he's really a great kid. He's, a, you know, he's, he's smart. He's attentive. Um, and obviously, he has a lot of natural talent. And, um, you know... What I'm trying to work with Ja'Kai right now is just understanding, you know, there's a specific approach to the game that he can take that can really make him, an, a, like, an extraordinary talent, right? There's things that he has to learn about just everyday basketball. And, and, and you want to play at a certain level, there are things that you have to do to get there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's, he's trying and he's working and he's, he's – <laughs> 
he has a, a an ability to be he has all the characteristics to be an, a, a great leader right but leadership is not easy at, at any in any capacity especially basketball so there's uncomfortability with it but I'm encouraged by how he's how hard he's working at it that he's coming in every day and giving it his best effort and you know we're, we're a team that's trying to put the pieces together right now it's just, you know it's a completely new team a lot of new faces you know you can have talent on the court but if everybody's not bought in to it and everybody's not dedicated to to the mission together it won't matter and he's been a big piece of the limited success that we've had so far you know every game that we've won he's played a big he's had a big hand in it so all the attention he's getting is um is is, is warranted uh, he's going to be a division 1 player obviously and I, I I really want him to be, and he's on the route to be a really good leader. All right. Uh, now I want to get into why it's, this is a two part question. But what are the good and the bad that you experience as a coach? As in whether it's seeing a player progress or the off the courts, whether it's school. Like, what are the good and bad that you've experienced as with as being a coach? The good and the bad that I've experienced. Well, I think the best part is when you're working with a kid and they they are able to put it together, and you know that you were able to contribute to their development, and they go on and they're successful. And whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily have to be basketball, but they're able to learn the lessons that you're trying to instill through basketball, and they carry it with them. You know, it's like when you try to draw up a play and it works. It's a good feeling. Mm -hmm. So that's the best uh, part. Of coaching, I wouldn't necessarily say there's bad. I think there's challenges. Okay, what's the what's what is, has been your biggest challenge, or one of them at least? Hmm. My biggest challenge. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's aspects of the game that you you know you wish, or, or the process of it that you wish were different. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Mead, the principal of yes. Eagle, Shout always tells me, um, you know, that this is a it's a political position. <laughs> right? Oh, what an answer! <laughs> Definitely, you know? yeah, political position. So there's this there's moments where you know you have impulses and you have opinions and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. you know, if you're gonna demand a level of discipline and accountability of your kids, you gotta display it, like I mentioned. So. You know, there's challenges with everything. There's challenges with kids. There's challenges uh, with scheduling. There's challenges with parents. There's challenges all over the case, all over the place. So, you know, just being mindful of the position I'm in at all times, understanding that, like I said, just similar with my kids, everybody's watching. Everybody is, um, you know, dependent. It's being, you know, being a leader of the program. You, you have it's a large responsibility and I, I take it seriously. So, you know, just being mindful of how I approach any situation. It's just it's a good thing. It's not really a, a bad thing. It's, it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge because it, it transfers to be a more disciplined individual. So with your upbringing and your background and the generation you come from, I have a more of a, I guess, opinionated question for you. Do you think that more guys from your era, your era of basketball, your era of life, should be giving back more to the youth in the basketball sense, whether it's the toughness, whether it's the no give up attitude because things are not just gonna get handed to you. Do you think more people from your generation need to be coaching this current one? If they're passionate about it and if um, their intentions are the right ones, uh, absolutely. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a generational thing. You know, I think, you know, you look at Gino, who's on our staff, um, who's played at a high level as well. You know, um, Gary mm -hmm. over there at Nazareth, who's doing a great job with those guys. You know, I think we have quite a few guys. My friend Rashad Bell is coaching uh, in the AU circuit. Mm -hmm. We got uh, quite a few guys from our generation, so to speak, who are back involved in New York City basketball. We're kind of in that generation where we are not too removed from the, the the younger guys now. Like mm -hmm. we know how to use our cell phones, and <laughs> <laughs> right, we know how to we, we post on Instagram too. Yeah. 
but we also remember what it was like before that and what the environment was. You know, I think there's some benefits of our generation's thinking just because of some of the experiences we had that these guys, you know, it doesn't, you know, kind of doesn't exist anymore. Like, New York City basketball, when I was coming up, I felt like we had a distinct advantage over other places because of our park culture. Like, how competitive it was to play in the parks when we were coming up, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I, you know, I'm from Queens. It's not the same as Brooklyn. I've been to Gertz. It's not that type of park culture. We had a different type of park culture, but it was equally as competitive. You come to the park with your crew, and the park is flooded, and if you... You know, you come in there and you lose, you may not, there's so many people, you may not see the court again. I think that led to a certain mentality towards the game, like a competitiveness, um, because you knew you could not, you could be off the court and just be shooting on the side watching the game. Damn straight. Um, that we miss now, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like the workout culture stuff, which mm-hmm. is which is needed. Um, but they can do that all over the world. There's a kid, you can work out in Wyoming, you can work out in Texas. It was nothing like going to a park in New York City. And, you know, that's where a lot of the learning of the game happened. So guys from our era, so to speak, having that experience and be able to transfer that toughness and competitiveness into our guys in any way that we can, I think they can benefit from it. But you got to, you know, it's, it's a full-time job, man. Coaching is... There's no days off. Like it's summertime. It's it's obviously the season. Mm-hmm. So if you you have to be dedicated f- to it, and you have to have a passion for helping kids, and it's um it's a lot. So as we wind down here, just a couple more questions. When it comes to Eagle and the people they play, schools they play, do you think is there a school that brings out the best? in Eagle, whether it's your your last, we'll call it since you started, but has there always been a school that every time you play, no matter what record they have or what record you guys have, it's always a battle? Uh, You know, you you try to avoid the um, Jeff as a rival thing, but I think at this point it's just, it is what it is. You know, you see the environment every time that we play them. Mm -hmm. We've, you know, we've had a history. before that chip game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we've had a history of, of chippy games and, um, you know, the, the, yeah, buzzer beaters and all sorts of stuff that we've had in the past. You know, they have a very particular culture. They're a really tough team. They, you know, they challenge you. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, you know, you, you got to have a lot of respect for the way that they that they play. Um, South Shore, obviously, is a team that we've clashed butt heads with the last couple of years quite a few times. But, you know, just in general, every team in Brooklyn is like that. BC is like that. Boys yeah, and Girls is about BC, yeah, like that. Yeah. Definitely BC is like that. Boys and Girls is like that. Lincoln, Canarsie, every every team in Brooklyn. And, you know, it's a very tough division. You you don't you don't come out ready to play and you're not gonna come out there alive. So um yeah. Okay. Every team in Brooklyn. So the I know that from recollecting um your progress as a coach at Eagle at when you got the head coaching job you suffered some two bad years before things started getting better. Yeah. I want to ask, as a coach and a, probably as a player, from the player in your head, what is it that 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 takes you from three games, three win seasons, four win seasons, to 20 win seasons? What's what's the switch? Of course, the talent has to yeah. change, but what's, what's the different dynamic that you would have at that point from when you're only barely winning a game to now it's like, okay, you're favored to win these games? Well, first off, I would I would definitely not consider those seasons the bad seasons. I, I think those kids um, from the first three seasons of Eagle really laid the foundation for what whatever we are now. They worked extremely hard, and we moved into a division that, you know, from a talent perspective, we were not ready for. And we were competitive every single day, and it was only because of the effort and energy that those guys put into it. They were, you know, from a talent perspective, there was an extreme deficit every single day. And they knew that if they didn't play as hard as they can, it could it would get ugly very quickly. So for us to, you know, sneak out those three or four or five wins that we got those years, 
um, I was really proud of that. And, I, and honestly, those are some of my most enjoyable times coaching, for real. Really? Honestly. So I got a lot of love for those guys, a lot of respect for those guys. And then you ask, you know, what's the transition is, you know, you get an Eric Acker and a Trayshawn Shepard, and a, <laughs> right? You get some names. When you get yeah. these guys, but not just the name, the kid, you mm -hmm. know? Like, we've had names in our program that, you know, transferred before the season started because they couldn't deal with the, the accountability that we put the kids through every single day. It's the special type of kid that I think we're getting more and more of now because they, I think they see the benefits of being in a program where you're held to that standard and being in a school like Eagle where you're going to get a great education as well. So the switch, uh, I think, is just, you know, kids who were natural basketball players that are eager to learn, um, that have a level of talent that gives us the opportunity to compete against teams who've traditionally uh, been at the top of the food chain. So uh, I guess these last two questions. The first question is, um, I know that we, we know that Eagle is an all-boys school. You guys have a sister school, but Eagle seems to be teaching the foundations for a man that you have education, you have your sports, and then you have to handle those two and then get on with your career and foundation in life. Is What do you say to guys that look at Eagle and be like, yo, bro, that's an old boy school. I'm <laughs> not really trying to go there. I need whatever, whatever. Like, I'm not saying you got, <laughs> like, like, I'm just trying to be real with you. Like, if we're, if we're being honest, I'm not saying a young man would be thinking of those things when looking up high schools, but if they say, if they see old boys school, that's a turnoff. So yeah. why should a guy come to Eagle, whether it's, of course, it's not just for the basketball program. It's not all basketball. You're quoted as saying, <laughs> I like this quote, um, Eagle was winning championships academically before yeah. the basketball team. Mm -hmm. So all of those things, why Eagle? Why should a young man come to Eagle? Well, I think it's about what you want for your life. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's a sacrifice, <laughs> I admit. <laughs> 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 if we being real facts. that is a sacrifice you know what i'm saying but the path of discipline is full of those sac types of sacrifices you know i, I saw this quote this and I, I stole it um and it was, you know there's a there's a pain of discipline there's a pain of regret right you can have those interactions that are you know for the most part not all of them are distractions you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying they, they, they take you off course from what your goals are I mean, you know, Eagle kids have a social life. We have dances, there's yeah. a sister school, there's, you know, a lot of our guys on our team have girlfriends. <laughs> and, uh, so it's not like you, you're excluded from those things, but it's a certain amount of time where you should be focused on your education and focus on your, your whatever athletic avenue you're trying to, to, to go into. Um, and I think Establishing that level of discipline at that age, especially in you know demographic of kids that we work with, is really important. And so you know maybe you know from a kid I get the argument, <laughs> right? But from a parent's perspective, yeah, I don't see why you Can't why would you not want to send your kid to Eagle? So um, we'll see. We've had a couple kids you know that brought that up to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know I I, uh, I understand it all all well. But, um, I, like I said, you know, I, I think the big, best, best and biggest gift that I, I have is perspective. And if you can instill kids, you know, having some perspective, understanding that, you know, it may not be a little less fun from this time to this time, but four years from now, you'll reap the benefits of it. Uh, if a kid can understand that, it'll be beneficial to them. All right, then, last but not least, uh, this is the time I always have my guests if they have something on their chest, if they got something they want to say, they can say it. This is your camera here. Uh, whatever message you got, whatever feeling on, you know? No. Nah. Take that time to Nothing. say Nothing. I appreciate. No, this was a great interview. I appreciate your time. I'm glad we, I know it's been a, a kind of back a and little forth, while. Yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but no, nah, this was cool, man. And uh, yeah, that's it. Well, Kev, Mr. Hamilton Jr. Yes. I uh, want to appreciate you for coming on the platform. Uh, I know that you've gone on other platforms. I know that 
you've done different things, but I hope this this one definitely left an impression on you. For sure. And uh, if you ever want to come back to the show, we can definitely do that again. Yeah, and uh, I just want to say thank you. Good luck to you during the season. I'll definitely be around. And uh, thank you again. Appreciate thank you, man. No doubt. And sir, that's another edition of Swing Important Live 101 Sit Downs. Hope you enjoyed. Catch you on the next one.